Good morning for another two and a half minutes, and then it's good afternoon. Thank you so much for coming out today. Can you believe the weather? Isn't the mountain beautiful? <laughs> and isn't it nice and sunny outside? We do that for Keith. We do that technical thing, building things for Keith. But we are really grateful that we get to be here at Persimmon. And I want to thank Ashante. He is standing over there. He wants to make sure that our meal is hot that the food is good and that he's serving us well. So I want to thank you very much for, for what you're doing, Ashante. Thanks. And I was also trying to kill some time to see if Kathy Grimes from Riverview Bank could be here before, um, not that Ashante wasn't important, but we need to thank our sponsors and our presenting sponsor is Riverview Community Bank and Kathy Grimes, as soon as she gets here, we will acknowledge that she is here. Also want to thank our stakeholder sponsors, Gresham Barlow School District. We have several board members here and we'll have them stand in a minute. And Portland General Electric. John Maloney, where are you? John, front and center, there we go. Thank you for that sponsorship. And our media sponsor, back from vacation, Metro East Community Media, Keith Thomas. Thank you, Keith. Nice to see you here. And I want to remind you that there are, okay, Betty, you get to applaud all by yourself. There. <laughs> okay. Um, I want to remind you that the replay uh, flyers listing the replay times is um, that they're not on your tables today, but they are on the way out the door so that you can re-listen to all the great stuff that you're going to hear today. We also want to acknowledge some elected officials are here, and I've noticed that there's an abundance of them for some reason that have, have come today. So if you are an elected official, a school board member, community college board member, a city council member, would you please stand up so that we can collectively thank you for your public service. Thank you so much. Thank you. Do you notice they're not all at the same table? That's unusual. They usually kind of cluster together. On your tables are a yellow piece of paper. This yellow piece of paper is giving you the opportunity to write any questions that you might have of our two speakers that we're going to hear from in a minute. And we do that so that we get to the question instead of the opinions ahead of time so that the legislators can actually answer the question. You're welcome to give them your opinion, but you can do that afterwards. So if you have a question, please mark it down, and during the question time, we will come around and collect those and ask them as appropriate as time allows. All right, I need to recognize my bosses. Many of you are them, but I have some that are on the board that I would like to acknowledge. I'm gonna acknowledge John Maloney at Portland General Electric once again. John, thank you very much. And he's on the executive committee too. We appreciate your extra service there. And Julie Reed with Mount Hood Medical Center. Julie, where are you? Julie, thank you very much for being a board member, a chamber board member. I am Lynn Snodgrass, the CEO of the Best Darn Chamber in Oregon. Soon, Michael, to be the best darn shaper in the Pacific Northwest. Someone asked me the other day how we get to be or how we will know when we're the best darn chamber in the Pacific Northwest, and I don't know. So I've got to figure that out because we're rapidly approaching that. But another amazing and phenomenal chamber in our local community is the West, um, is the West Columbia Gorge Chamber of Commerce, right? Close enough, I'm going to introduce Karen Young, who is the CEO of another great chamber in our area, second best in Oregon, soon to be the second best in the Pacific Northwest. Please welcome Karen Young. Wow. Well, I can tell you why they would be considered the best is because Lynn is a great collaborator and works really well with the other organizations in the area. So, Thank yes. <laughs> um, before I get started, I want to introduce our new board president of the West Columbia Gorge Chamber of Commerce and Visitor Center. Yes, I know that's a mouthful. Uh, Glenn Mackey. He is the owner of Jay Gelati, um, which is Italian ice and frozen custard, along with his wife, Sally, who is here with him. And uh, so I brought some notes because otherwise I'll go into um, automatic pilot and start talking about Summerfest, which, by the way, is this Saturday morning at 11 a.m., starting with the parade in downtown Troutdale, followed by fun activities in Glen Auto Park, which will last until 4 o'clock in the afternoon. So 
please come down. So, legislative session, I just wanna quickly say that in trying to follow this session, I realized it could be really a full-time job, daunting. Even letting a week go by or a few days without checking in and I things, found things are going in a different direction and so I certainly don't have the bandwidth to keep up with it all and I wanna say I fully appreciate the efforts of our partner organizations, the Gresham Area Chamber and East Metro um, Economic Alliance. So, Lynn, I want to say thank you so much for inviting us to participate, and Jarvez. Um, so, I'd like to say to our state senators who are here, along with this, looking at all that goes on with le legislation, I want to thank um, them for being here. And whether we agree or disagree on issues, I fully respect and appreciate the great effort and commitment it takes to do your jobs. You have to make difficult decisions and deal with a lot of contentiousness at times from both uh, within and without, and I wanna thank you. Uh, there is so much potential in our region with the amazing growth we're experiencing, but with that comes, of course, challenges. Uh, tourism has become a major uh, industry in Oregon, and uh, we have seen that our focus is now less on marketing and more on managing. Um, and transportation issues are becoming a huge challenge for us. So I could go on and on, but I know I don't have a lot of time. So I just want to add that the need to work in collaboration with our partners is extremely evident to us. It's apparent that we need to be working together to deal with our issues. Um, and I'm looking forward to it. Thanks, Lynn. As Karen mentioned, we are partnering today with East, with EMI, East Metro Economic Alliance, and the West Columbia Gorge Chamber, as well as the Gresham Chamber, to bring all of you together so you didn't go to three different ones. We're going to, we got you all together, and it's great partnering with such good folks. Um, before I introduce the next guest speaker up here, I want to acknowledge that we have somebody new among us that's from Texas, but I'm not going to let her talk because she talks too slow. Been we only have an hour, right? Would you like to stand up? <laughs> the new superintendent of Gresham Barlow School District. We'd like you to introduce him. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. I'm sorry, what'd you say? I'm actually from Louisiana. Okay. Louisiana. Well, I was surprised that she was here, so I didn't come prepared, and I apologize for that. But, you know, any place outside of Oregon boundaries is south. So Texas, Louisiana, whatever. So thank you for being here and for taking the time to be here today. All right, next on the agenda, I'm going to bring up the president of EMI, Sue O'Halloran. I want to acknowledge Jarvez, who is the executive director of EMI. Jarvez, thanks for being here. But Sue O'Halloran is going to address us and give us a few comments from the EMI perspective. Sue? Good afternoon, everybody. Actually, I have quite a few of the East Metro Economic Alliance board members here, but I'm not gonna put myself in jeopardy and name you all. So if I could have my members of the East Metro Economic Alliance board stand up, our directors. I just wanted to kind of recognize that we have quite a few of them here today. So thank you very much. Um, actually, I was told I had time for like, you know, two sentences here, so you don't have to hear a speech here. But um, we had a really good legislative committee that worked with EMI this year. And we did a lot of um, correspondence, some visits, phone calls with our uh, legislators. And I'm, I'm really glad to say that we have two of them here, our senators, who are really responsive to us. And we greatly appreciate that. The other one I wanted to mention, because I thought it was unusual, because oftentimes he would let us know ahead of time and ask for some opinions, and that's Representative Mark Johnson. He's not here today with us, but I wanted to uh, 
publicly acknowledge what a great job that he did in corresponding and keeping us abreast of issues. So really, I came today just to actually um, to make a couple of comments on behalf of EMI and its legislative uh, committee, and some of those members are here today. So a um, couple of you have heard me already say this, but from our perspective, the 2017 session was much like the one before that, and its focus has been on societal issues. And unfortunately, what happens is that there's small regard then for what the effect is on a strong and healthy employment environment. And the thing that we talk about all the time, the importance of jobs here. So that has been really what our focus has been from EMI and um, what our request is really is that we would spend more time on the front end as you're beginning to think about issues and what's coming up for the session. Um, and regardless of whether it's your city or the school district, um, Amy is here to help and to look at how those issues affect having a really healthy environment here and really the resulting jobs that we all recognize that we need to have here in our communities out here in East County and North Clackamas County as far as that goes too. So um, on a positive note, I do want to recognize that we got a transportation bill and that has been a priority on our agenda for I don't know how many years, but that we actually achieved that. Um, now we'll be on the watch to make sure that transportation, um, from the perspective of what the needs are, are out here, and we have um, a really great committee, and a couple of those members are here today on land use and transportation at EMI, and we will be really very interested to see how this transportation bill begins to materialize and, and what kind of benefits we can make sure um, as our personal and um, issues out here. These are what make our companies and our businesses be able to work and offer the jobs that we know are so important for our kids. So with that, um, thank you very much. Thank you, Sue. Today we tried to make the lunch menu a kind of a traditional all-American. And what you're missing right now is warm apple pie over there. So in a couple of minutes, I know that you won't be distracting any of the speakers that are up here, but if you want to kind of saunter over and get some warm apple pie and come back, that would be good. But don't say, ooh, that's yummy out loud. Okay, we'll do that. The last speaker that I'd like to bring up is one that you are familiar with if you come to these functions on a regular basis, and that is the president of the chair of the Government Affairs Council for the Gresham Chamber of Commerce. Brian Lessler from PDG Construction. Brian, would you come on up, say a few words, and then you'll be introducing our speakers. Remember to fill out your forms, ask questions for the questions, and if you'll raise them up, I will come around and pick them up. Oh, so this is a tattle now that you've got in trouble? Okay. Did we bring you enough paper, Michael? Okay, there we go. Thank you. Brian Lessler. Brian? Thank you. I think that was more of a whine, actually. Thank you. Really, um, succinct comments from both Karen and Sue, and I appreciate that. Um, I'm going to be on a little bit different track. Um, Maybe a little bit of a story for you. So like many of you uh, this morning, I got up at 5 o'clock. Maybe not, huh? I don't know. I did my usual routine, you know, reading, exercise, the essentials, and then I drove to work at my company. We have about 25 employees. <clears throat> We're a small company. Uh, those employees represent about 56 total family members. They live in Oregon, all but one anyhow. Um, shop in Oregon, they play in Oregon, they get their children educated in Oregon. So it's imperative that uh, my little company 
uh, maintain a very profitable operation so that it can grow, providing new employment opportunities and, adva and advancements for existing employees. When we accomplish profitability, we help to pay home mortgages, college tuitions, and contribute to employee retirement plans. We pay bonuses and the money cycles back in through our regional economy. My company builds things, commercial buildings, shopping centers, apartments, mixed use developments, <clears throat> senior housing facilities, and we're very proud of the work that we do. It's a very long process, starting with land acquisition, design, Tim Bruner, the Access Design Group, uh, contract negotiations, financing, all of these come before the actual construction starts. The construction process is frequently a year or more. And finally, a certificate of occupancy is issued so that the building can be put into uh, active use. <clears throat> it's a high risk business and many things can derail a development at any stage of that project cycle. So every time the legislature is in session, <clears throat> I start to worry. What are they going to do this time to make the cost of doing business higher and more difficult? How will these new laws affect the lives of my employees, which ultimately affect their livelihood and our company? Remember what Mark Twain said? <clears throat> no man's life, liberty, or property is safe while the legislature is in session. No offense. Many would say this session was more worrisome than normal if you own a business. The bills that flooded the committees were not only full of anti-business ideas, they would have been devastating uh, in many opinions to Oregon's economy. <clears throat> Mark Twain also said the difference between the tax man and the taxidermist is that the taxidermist leaves the skin. Some of, the, some of the bills that didn't get passed in session are now popping up as initiative petitions. Another gross receipts tax battle is shaping up, and OEA is champion of that bill, of that petition, I sh should say. <clears throat> Excuse me. Today, there's less money in education flowing to the classrooms, not because there is less money coming from tax revenues, but it's because a higher and higher percentage of public school budgets is going to fund PERS debt. If education funding is one of the biggest priorities to the legislature, many wonder why fixing the biggest cost driver uh, was not a priority as well. So this evening after a late meeting, I'll drive home, maybe go to the fridge for a cold drink, maybe a beer, sit on my deck, <clears throat> but I won't relax. When you own your own business, you never stop thinking about all the decisions, the issues, the problems, the possibilities, the people, and yes, the politics that will await you the next morning. Thankfully and gratefully, we have two senators with us today that are available to help by sharing their views on the 2017 session and to take the time to answer our questions. We are very grateful for public servants that step up and communicate, and we thank you for taking time to address the leaders in our East County communities. Speaking in this order today are Senators Lori Monis Anderson and followed by Senator Chuck Thompson. <clears throat> we had invited others today, Representatives Carla Peluso and Chris Gorsuch, uh, chose not to accept our invitations to speak today. So, with that, it's my pleasure to have Senator Lori Monis Anderson step to the podium. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you, Ryan. Actually, I'm glad the House members aren't here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, it was, it was contentious between the Senate and the House. Uh, we did a lot of collaboration 
uh, with Republicans on many bills, and we killed many bills that came from the House. And that's just how it was. And um, we began, we actually began the session with the most aggressive agenda in my legislative career. Um, we made a run at more big issues than ever before, and we did have some satisfying wins. Uh, we structurally changed key ways in which we budget. We enacted a budget-saving provider tax. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. We, we passed the largest, as been said, the largest transportation plan in state history. But we also had some losses, and we did not reach an agreement on PERS reform, and I um, served on that committee. Um, we could not get the votes in the Senate. Um, so, and we also did not reform our revenue system, which we still need to do, but we need to have businesses and labor at the table, but they, we, we weren't successful in having that happen. At best, I think our successes were actually te tempered by some disappointment in, in those successes. But in, in the Senate, and I hope Chuck agrees with me, that we did have some remarkable successes, Democrats and Republicans. They, we worked together on almost every issue. We talked to ed we each, each other, we listened to each other, and we sought consensus. And on three key policy bills, we brought employers and employees together on what were once divisive issues, and those came over from um, the House. But we have a new uh, pay equity law, uh, which means women and minorities have a fair shot at being paid the same as their coworkers. Uh, overtime rules have been clearly spelled out, and thanks to, yes, um, no, I've forgotten your name, yeah, um, who actually let me know about this problem as well as Lynn Snodgrass did, et cetera, and so that's been taken care of. Our statewide predictive scheduling law is the first in the nation. Um, I was on the committee that where it came, and I was the one that wouldn't let it out of committee, and so then the bill went to rules, and then they came up with Tim Kamope and, and uh, Peter Courtney's office, and uh, Kathleen Taylor worked on our predictive scheduling. It was a bipartisan bill that came out. But none of these advancements would have been possible without unprecedented bipartisan cooperation. We did pass the budget, as you know, it's balanced. And that's the one absolute job that we did have to complete. And it doesn't happen automatically. Um, we, our budget is the best we could do without real revenue form. It funds schools better than expected. Uh, we did give them a billion dollars more than the last biennium. I would love to talk with you. I haven't met you yet. Um, it, it, per, um, it limits tuition increases, um, and it protects the Oregon health plan. Our kids need to be healthy. Uh, I just want to add a little bit more to the transportation package. Um, it does provide maintenance, seismic upgrades, and congestion relief. It includes transit, bike paths, and safe routes to schools. And that wasn't easy. It, there were certain people that wanted certain projects. We'd get it done, and then people would come back and say, no, that's not what we want. We want something different. But it really required a lot of dedication, determination, and compromise. And I think the stakeholders did step up and became equal partners with the uh, leaders of the committee. Uh, and for instance, uh, I want to list what each of us gets out here. Um, Fairview gets 226 thousand uh, dollars. Gresham gets 2.7 million dollars. Portland gets 16 million. Troutdale gets 405 thousand. Wood Village gets 99 thousand. Multnomah County gets 18 million. So out of that package, those will be the monies that they will get. Uh, regarding the provider tax, we could not have balanced the budget uh, without the hospitals and insurers and providers coming to the table and, uh, and actually helped uh, craft the provider tax. And it really made it possible for us to balance our budget. Otherwise, over 330,000 um, people would have lost their health, health insurance. So um, it would have been catastrophic. And I'm, I'm extremely proud of the Senate and the work that we did on getting um, this bipartisan uh, 
legislation through. Um, we avoided some devastating um, cuts to mental health. I chair the Senate Health Care Committee, and um, we made some modest investments in community treatment, not nearly as much as we need. We took steps to enforce mental health parity, but we still have a whole lot of work to do. Mental health must become and must remain a burner issue as far as I'm concerned. Public safety, I think you'd be glad to hear that we were able to fund MGET, East Metro Gang Enforcement Team, again. Uh, this started with um, Karen Minnis back in 2001 or three, um, and we have been able to maintain it. We are the only jurisdiction that gets money for its public safety program, so uh, we fight like crazy for it. Um, and that was about $2 million, that, a little over $2 million that'll come. Uh, we added 20 new state troopers, many of them in the areas of the state that are rural. Um, there is a growing challenge with the drug cartels in this state. We increased protections for victims of child sex trafficking and the worst repeat sex offenders. Um, they will now face life in prison. And Oregon uh, may be one of the first states to actually take that action. Um, a personal bill uh, that affects schools uh, is uh, the school nursing bill. Um, Representative Wisnett, who's a Republican from the um, House, and I have worked extremely hard on getting a school nursing bill on. We were on a task force, and basically school districts will be g given assistance to bill Medicaid for the nursing services that they provide in the schools. This will bring in millions of dollars to the school districts uh, and hundreds of thousands of dollars to each school district. I'm very proud of that bill, and um, it's about time that we uh, give school nurses and, uh, their opportunity um, to not take general fund money and use health care dollars. Cover all kids, we have to have healthy kids, and we extended the health care coverage through the Oregon Health Plan to more than 17,000 kids currently excluded because of their residency status. I believe health care is a right. I know there are some people that don't here, but um, if we don't have healthy kids, they aren't able to grow and, and be the, become um, well-educated, be able to live to their full p potential. So uh, I'm ex excited about that. I also worked hard on domestic violence issues. Uh, I'm very proud of that. But I'm also proud of the money that we are bringing um, to Rockwood Rising, the Rockwood Center. Um, we, with a budget, I was concerned we wouldn't have this, but we got $2 million for Rockwood Rising. Um, and that will be a workforce training center in the Rockwood neighborhood. I'm excited about that. Uh, and 12 million for the Oregon Manufacturing Innovation Center where Boeing is going to create this awesome, awesome center. And if you don't know about it, please find out about it because um, that is definitely going to help our um, economy and jobs. Um, I would like to state that housing was a very contentious issue, as many of you know, and I have had uh, a lot of you talking to me about it. Uh, I will say that we passed one bill that I'm, I'm proud of. Uh, Mike McKeel has wanted an ADU bill, and I, um, we worked hard, but the one bill we did pass increases the supply of both market rate and affordable housing by actually removing some barriers at the local level. It's, it's a preemption and it'll, it'll make for more affordable housing and it will actually increase the option for developing ADUs or accessory dwelling units. Uh, and I'm excited about that and I wanna work a little bit more, especially on Mike McKeel's issue that he wants to have. Um, uh, I am vice chair of the Veterans Committee, and we worked hard on veterans' issues, and we funded them fabulously. I, I don't want to go into it. I know there are people say that we didn't, but we actually did fund exactly what the voters wanted, and we increased their budget by $4.35 million uh, for the county veteran service officers. We are not doing enough for our veterans, and um, that was the bill that I really worked hard, and I'm, I'm proud of that. So um, I have one minute left, so uh, I guess I'll end with um, 
I am frustrated uh, with um, the partisanship, but I am proud of the Senate, um, and we certainly have a lot more to do. Thank you. Good afternoon now, and thanks for having me. Um, most of you know I'm, I live in Hood River, so um, I always get the furthest uh, drive away when I come down to any chamber meetings or whatever I do down here. Uh, part of my district, it, I end up almost to um, oh, Clackamas High School. Um, all, I'm in one street away from Centennial High School, a couple of blocks from Mount Hood, so um, mainly over towards Damascus and Boring, but not all of the more, or not all of Boring in Damascus. Uh, so I, I would say my district is very gerrymandered. Yeah. <laughs> so um, my view. I hate talking about the session. Kyle, we were just down there for five months. It's like a nightmare. You know, both Lori and I, we live so far away. Uh, we're some of the few legislators, mainly the rural ones, that um, come home on the weekend. And, and I'm a, I have, my family has a pear orchard, so I come home on the weekends. And one weekend's doing uh, payroll for our pear operation. And my dad moved to um, Wyoming. Usually the kids move away from home when, when they get married. When I got married, my mom and dad moved away from home. So I do all the book work and stuff for our ranch in Wyoming. And uh, oh, by the way, the the um, employment and regulations and stuff in, in Wyoming is a lot less than it is in Oregon. Oh my gosh. So, and then, you know, pay bills. I, I taught my daughter how to pay bills um, and balance my books and do all that stuff. And then she, she had a baby, so I lost my book paper. So I had to do that. Usually I get home on Saturdays and get all that stuff done and spend a little time with family. Then we're back in Salem um, Monday through Friday. So it's, um, and I'm on the main um, Ways and Means Budget Committee, which meets on Friday morning. So I usually don't get home till Friday afternoon. So I guess my review of the session back when we first went in there, you know, we know ahead of time we're going to be dealing with 3,000 bills. Um, at the time you go in, everybody's got 15 or 20. I'm a Republican, so, so um, I can't tell you, um, I don't have a lot of success stories by my bills passing. It's just kind of the way it is down there. One, my, the one bill that um, uh, did get passed was actually on the news the other day, but it, it was stolen by one of my Senate uh, Republican buddies. He lives over in um, Canby. His district goes out towards Estacada, and I used to represent Estacada. And, and what happened was uh, my constituent, who I hadn't, didn't know, went across the road and talked to his neighbor because he wanted to put in some cider, uh, do some cider stuff, hard cider. And his neighbor says, oh, get a hold of my state, your, my state senator, Alan Olson. So they did. And Alan did the bill for him, but he luckily he let me sign on to it. So it's like, you know, and I and after it was publicized, I'm a pear grower, so I t I took all the credit for it. <laughs> but ends up it was my constituent who lived across the road, and and I'm the pear guy, and and I don't even get to do the bill. But uh, what what that little bill does, if you want to do hard cider, apple, or pear, it just gives you the um, ability to to be kind of like a winery is now where you can do all the activities on EFU land. Uh, so it was a good bill. And what what's real, what was good about that bill is we didn't change a word in the bill other than took out wine and put in apples and pears. So that way um, all the e uh, land use folks don't get up in arms and fight the bills because when something like that happens, it, 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 a lot of bills go sideways. So. I think when we went into session, we had three three main things that everybody talked about, and you all read about Oregon Live. Uh, usually, I get all my information off Oregon Live as far as uh, what's happening in Salem. Um, so it's like we knew we had to do transportation, and we knew we had a, uh, some revenue issues, cost containment issues, uh, and dealing with PERS. Well, as you expect. When, when we got in there, we started, the Republican caucus started working on cost containment. We said, we need a billion dollars in cost containment. And then we need some PERS reform. And then if we need extra revenue at the end, we'll, do, we'll be willing to look at some new revenue. And of course, 
L Lori's party goes in, her caucus goes in, and we go, we need new revenue. So all session long, that's kind of what would happen. So we did, a, we did, we came up with a billion in cost containment things, uh, and and of course the other side wasn't willing to do that. But here's here's what's going on. Y you all heard at the beginning of the session we're 1.8 billion dollars in the hole. We have a shortfall of 1.8 billion. There was never a 1.8 billion dollar shortfall. Uh, we're calling it a desired. Sp Spending level, DSL. How many of you got a 14% raise last two years? Everybody came in my room, I asked them that question, and nobody did. So what's going on is, the in order to keep up with purse funding, which was talked about before, uh, the Medicaid issues that we're dealing with, we took on 350,000 new people with Medicaid, and then um, the the, per, um, the benefit package from state employees is, is just, in order to keep up, we have to spend 14%. We gave schools an 11% increase, and they're calling it a cuts budget, because of like, I think PERS is 23% of most school districts' um, obligations every year, plus all the, um, all the other uh, personnel costs. So we're bringing in about 4% revenue. And we're, we had record revenue this session. So if we continue to bring in record revenue at 4% and continue to spend at 14%, what, what's that look like? Three, three, two, or two more sessions? It's like a $9 billion deficit. So in, in the end, what, what the inside story stuff that Oregon Live won't, won't, re, or won't write about we, we had a new state senator from um, Medford, Grants Pass, really, really neat guy. Uh, Ashland is, is a very liberal area. Well, he was a mayor of Ashland, and he's a Republican. And we had a um, state senator that passed away a uh, couple of, like last year, a great guy, uh, Dr. Alan Bates from Medford. And so he replaced him, and he came to Salem um, saying we need to raise taxes and, and, and it's got to go towards purse. We've got to reduce that. And we're going, Alan, that, you can't do that. You're, you're a Republican. You can't, you can't raise taxes. And we had 13 in our caucus. So if, if on, the Demo on the Senate side, if you got one Republican to vote for taxes, we would have had new taxes. So what do they come up with? Mark Hass. Uh, Senator from the Hillsborough area, on the he chairs the Revenue Committee. They came up with this brilliant idea. Just after we, um, the voters turned down the gross receipts tax, they came up with this brilliant idea to do a gross receipts tax in the legislature. Oh, really? So he worked with uh, Alan DeBoer all session. Because Alan said, yeah, we need a tax. All they needed was one Republican vote. And I kind of became good friends with um, Alan, spent a lot, a lot of time with him and told him a lot of stuff and, and tried to make him understand. But when you're a rookie legislator, there's so much to understand. Uh, everybody, was his, uh, everybody was his friend. Everybody was his buddy because all they needed was his vote. So for like four months, You'd see Mark and him on the floor chatting, and, 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 I'm, and I would, I, you can't do that. It's horrible. All session long, but he wouldn't listen. I don't know why he wouldn't listen to me. Jeez, I, I got a lot of experience doing that stuff. But anyway, he's his own guy, and, and we just kind of went along. And then about May, he took the figures home to his brother, Lithium Motors, one of the big car dealers. Well, he, he's got three himself, but um, took it home and, and his brother's accountants looked at it and said, this will more than double our taxes. So he came back and said, oh, that's a horrible idea. I go, oh, really? <laughs> it took five months to figure that one out. So that really is the reason we didn't have new taxes. It's that, it's that simple. And, and by that time, they tried some new stuff. You know, they always say they, uh, they don't want to 
uh, burden and put taxes on small business owners. The other tax that they came up with, Nike would have paid $350. In situ would have paid $350. Oh, we need to tax the corporations. They don't pay taxes. That's what they always say. And, and guess they would have, um, it would have doubled probably uh, S corporations taxes. And so luckily that didn't happen. Uh, the big losers are we didn't get, uh, real, really, we didn't get any cost containment. We voted on something, but guess who came up with this plan? Cost containment and PERS reform? The SEIU union did it. That's who came up with the plan. And by the time it came to vote, we were, I was getting emails from all, all kind of state workers that says, don't cut my purse, don't. And so that, even that, oops, even that went away. So uh, we got a lot to do, in, like Lori said, in the future. Uh, I, will, I agree with Lori 100%. There were some really, really interesting um, things that happened, like uh, 2004, the, the bill to put, um, rent control on and all that stuff. Uh, there were three, I believe, Lori, Rod, Betsy, that, that said, uh, no, we're not gonna do that. They, I, I, I'm not sure, I don't know who it was. A busload of folks showed up at Rod Monroe's church on a Sunday to protest. Well, it backfired on them. I think we had more votes in the Senate to kill that both sides because that's, that's, they did that to Rob Monroe. And so there was a couple other issues where they, the, it's, it's, this business is getting a lot more unruly. People are just you know, willing to, they don't just sit out in the Capitol steps and protest, they'll come in the building and make a lot of noise and chant and do all kind of stuff. So it's getting tougher to, to do this job. But I think the Senate kind of revolted against that. And I, looking back, I think we had a pretty good session. We, we got issues like spending and, and those kind of things we got to deal with that we didn't deal with, but we didn't get new taxes, so that's a good thing. Thank you so much, yeah. Senator. Um, Senator, if you want to stay up there, and Senator Monis Anderson, if you'd like to go up and you guys can sit in the chairs, we're going to start asking questions. If any of you have questions, just raise them up, and Shelly and I will come and pick them up. I'm going to turn the microphone over to Brian, who will be the spokesperson for the questions. All right, we have an easy one to start with. <clears throat> so is this turned on? going to answer Michael's. <laughs> so first question, will the short session in 2018 be limited, or will it have a full range of issues? What do you anticipate in 2018? You're not going to sit and answer? No, I like standing. Uh, what the Senate has done is said we're going to limit the bills to one one bill uh, for each senator. Last time it was two. I hated the short session. We should only be focusing on um, uh, budget issues, and so I'm very concerned about uh, the the legislative session. So, at least in the Senate, we are only going to uh, we're going to limit to one, and the and but the House has decided no. We also um, it was um, Senator, um, who's from Eastern Oregon? Um, Hansel? Yeah, Senator Hansel and Senator Canope, myself and Senator Jenny Burdick, really wanted to come up with a plan where it, every bill had to be bipartisan in the, in the short session. And, but we can't get enough votes to do that at this point. We're still working on it, but at least we've cut down the number of bills on the Senate side. But I, I am very concerned that we are tackle, tackling too many tough issues in the short session when we don't really have enough time. Uh, like my Senate Health Care Committee, all the Senate bills, um, I need to get them out within four meetings into the other chamber. And that's just not a, enough time to work. So hopefully that answered your question. Any further thoughts, Chuck? Yeah. I, I expect to see a whole lot of crap in the short session. <laughs> you remember this is being recorded. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> you should hear them on the floor of the Senate. <laughs> okay, here's a good question um, from the new superintendent of Gresham Barlow School District. Uh, one way to improve public education without spending more money is to cut or eliminate 
the red tape or bureaucracy that makes it difficult for teachers and administrators to do their jobs effectively. How would you propose getting that done? Well, I would love to cut out all of the testing requirements. A lot of that, though, is federal, and we have to meet the demands of, of the feds uh, or we don't get the money that they, they sent, send to us. But I would love to have your input on it. I think the best legislation comes with the grassroots people, and if you would come and let's talk to figure out exactly what red tape you want to get rid of, and boy, I'd be willing to work on that. A lot of what happens in Salem on education is directed by the uh, OEA unions and stuff like that. Um, the, they, they're pretty pow powerful down there, so they dictate a lot of what happens. We did um, uh, Measure 98 to get uh, more dollars, and the folks voted on initiative last fall to get more dollars into CTE programs. When Governor Kitzhopper was there, that's what he focused on. And uh, he fought. He fought the OEA. They didn't even support him in the, his last election cycle. Um, and as soon as uh, Governor Kitzhopper left, that left, which brought on the initiative. Um, so uh, we we got I think 170 million to to go towards that for schools. Uh, I think that's a great idea. Get our kids back in some of those programs like that we, we used to have like shop and automotive and now it's robotics and, and, and all that stuff and I think that'll help kids. Um, a lot of things that you can do to answer that question is if there is a, if, if the legislature um, tells schools what they should be doing, it should, it should come with the dollars to do it. And too often that's what happens. Uh, like 12 years, 10 or 12 years ago, they said uh, schools, you're gonna have more PE time. Well, that's great, everybody everybody wants to have more PE time, but they didn't put any money in there to, to do that. And so the, uh, 10 or 12 years later, they still haven't uh, initiated that, but it's a state law and, and schools are supposed to do that. They've kind of let them off the hook so far uh, because we haven't given them the dollars to do it. So if you're gonna make schools do something, uh, send the money with it. I also want to point out what, uh, if you were at the EMI meeting, um, what was it, two days ago or, or last week, or last week, <laughs> uh, all the days run together, um, the Boeing, what the Boeing, uh, I don't know if he was a government relations person or what, but he said, you know what, schools need to start getting their kids to start building things again. When we had shop and home ec, he even mentioned home ec, I mean, you have the recipe, you follow, you know, um, uh, wood shop, metals, car shop, auto, automotive, all of that. We need to get back into having these kids building things and making things and and it really resonated with me um, and so I, I was quite impressed with that comment so I wanted to share that with you uh, this is a somewhat of a follow-up question to your statements there uh, Mount Hood Community College is a huge a huge asset in this region and community colleges uh, really did not get the funding other public systems uh, did uh, we need a champion to help retain Mount Hood Community College status in the region. How can you help? Well, I've been helping on the, the bonds with money primarily and with wor word of mouth. Um, I, I just think the world of Deborah Durr and she has been so active. I'm, we're gonna miss her and I know that they will be coming up with you know, someone just as good, I'm sure. But. Um, it's hard from this community. We are a more blue collar community. And, um, and when it comes to taxes, um, the community college bonds, we can't pass it because the people here, their bottom line is, as they say they can't afford taxes. I would love ideas from you. Again, I don't know, Chuck, if you have ideas on how we can get our communities to support our, our community colleges, but I know that um, I don't serve on the Ways and Means Committee, but Rod Monroe does, and he, he takes care of the community colleges uh, with, with funding. Um, that's about all I can say on that issue. I I've been on the education sub budget committee for two sessions now. Um, we've, if you look back 10 or 15 years, 
uh, what they've done with education funding, uh, worse at the college and um, community college level is they've taken those dollars uh, away. Uh, probably, I think, probably 10 or 15 years ago, the state general fund was about 40-some percent towards schools and education. Uh, it got as low as about 29 percent, and I think we've got it back up to about 34 percent. A lot of those dollars were diverted to um, health and human services uh, because they can chase federal dollars. And to build state government and bring more dollars into the state for uh, the the SEIU unions and outfits like that, they've taken the dollars away from education in the last 15 years to build to build up because that's how they get, get the, a lot of those dollars are there for matching dollars. Uh, until we stop doing that and, and prioritizing uh, those kind of things, the, the, you go down the list, it's K through 12 is the first, and then they, they'll go towards higher ed. Uh, they got almost what they asked for and then they there's always there's always somebody left behind in this business down there and and, and it's always uh, community colleges so until that changes uh, the way you look at school funding they've you know they've put college education on the backs of middle and upper income students there they have a lot of dollars they give towards poor students uh, because they can't afford to go to college, so they've given up a lot of those dollars. But if you look at the kids that come out of college now, with 20, I think the average is $27,000 in debt, that's where the legislature has decided that's how you're going to fund higher ed. They've done, we've put four, 30 or $40 million into uh, the Oregon Promise program, which um, is dollars that go towards um, community colleges. So tuition for community colleges. So the dollars that are in the community college budget don't reflect that. So that's kind of an extra $40 million, and that'll help a lot of our kids. And it doesn't matter your income level. You, you can get uh, free education for a couple of years, and, uh, and, and uh, hopefully that'll get into the uh, – on, on their last couple of years too. And Deborah Durr did uh, share with me that I think there was almost 700 kids at Mount Hood Community College that are taking advantage of the Oregon Promise yeah, and so having, okay. so it is a good program. Thank you. Yeah. Um, there are a number of questions uh, about gross receipts tax. I'm going to attempt to synthesize them into one question for you. So the gross receipts tax seems to be an Oregon manufactured goods tax. Uh, manufacturers will pay, and the goods they purchase will be taxed uh, multiple times. Uh, many states waive sales tax on raw materials uh, or materials for manufacturing. And this is also the case with uh, a lot of construction, uh, a lot of states that have sales tax uh, related to construction if it's to be re-engaged in the construction process, it's exempt, uh, gets taxed on the back end. Um, other questions related to gross receipts tax have to do with what we understand is a uh, constitutional change with respect to the, uh, the voting that's necessary to pass an additional tax. So could you explain your positions with respect to gross receipts taxes uh, what your position is uh, on that issue, um, and how you would how you would vote. Uh, well, I think we know how you both voted the first time around. But uh, what would be your position uh, as this initiative comes to uh, the public again? Uh, I have all. I am not on the revenue committee. Uh, I am not in even a part of the designing of that. I said that if there is a compromise uh, revenue package uh, with bipartisan support, I will vote for it. And I've always taken that stand. I cannot get into the minutia. I know Bess Wills. I know she's not here. It really took me down and explained exactly how uh, the gross receipts tax would affect uh, the Ford dealership, but um, that's my stand on it. I, I want a, bipar a bipartisan uh, revenue package, and until there's a revenue package that's bipartisan, um, I won't be voting for one unless there's bipartisan support. 
Oh, that's a horrible bill. Um, I don't think I was. I'm not on the revenue committee either, but um, one of my buddies from Grants Pass it sits on there, and he worked. He worked on that. Um, oh, all session they would meet at night. Sometimes they worked really hard to get that tax. Uh, one of the the interesting things I had the governor staff in my office in May um, working on that tax for the governor because she she wanted it all of a sudden and and he told he's in my room and, and he tells me Chuck well first he asked me where I stood on it and I said no that's a horrible tax and then he goes we we need to we need to pass this gross receipts tax because we have to trick Oregon voters it's the only way we're going to get to a sales tax so what they do, they started, this gets to your question, they started it out and it would only affect you if you had $3 million in gross receipts. So, oh, you know, they think that's going to let a lot of people off the hook. Uh, so what they'll do, uh, they, they could do this in one session. with Instead of 18 votes, now it just takes a simple majority and they could, they could send, set that $3 million number to zero and you have a sales tax on everything with 16 votes. That's what they were after. Uh, they tried to trick Oregonians in, into a sales tax. Um, the, the other trouble with the gross receipts tax was uh, if you are an LLC or an S Corp, guess what? You get to pay both of them. They, didn't, they weren't gonna take away the other one. So it, it um, I thought, I think it would have brought in like $3 billion and most of it would have come uh, as soon as the 3 million, I don't know how many of you gross uh, $3 million, but um, the next year it would be 2 million or 1 million or zero. So uh, it's their way of starting a sales tax and, and the governor's chief of staff told me that in my office. I, I was shocked, I couldn't believe he even said that wasn't the governor, it was his chief of staff. I think he's still working for her, but I never told the governor what he said either, so I kind of kept that quiet. Okay, thank you. So, uh, moving on to uh, another topic. Um, the West Columbia Gorge Chamber is interested in tourism, which is an $11.3 billion industry in Oregon and rapidly growing. Travel Oregon began in 2003 with House Bill 2267 as an approach to building Oregon's economy which was very successful. Important tourism legislation passed in the 2016 session with House Bill 4146, which is expected to amplify the effects of House Bill 2267 on Oregon's economy. What will you do to help support and further this industry? That had to be Michael's question. That was no, that no, that's from West Columbia Gorge oh. Chamber. Um, I think that's a bipartisan issue primarily on um, wanting to promote tour tourism uh, in the state of Oregon. Uh, I know there have been some bills that we have passed to help tourism, um, but I, uh, you know, our 2017 legislative accomplishment book just came out yesterday, so I haven't had a chance to go over some of those bills uh, or ideas um, that we had addressed regarding tourism. So I'm not the right person to respond to that question. Can you respond to tourism at all? I, I live in Hood River and we have, it's like the tourist capital of the world anymore. Um, I, I, think, I think it's growing all over our region. I, I, I think you said it, it's not promoting it now, it's managing it. Uh, like they, they started the uh, bus system out to Mult Multnomah Falls. Uh, every time I drive through there, that lot is completely full. Uh, I, I did have a constituent complain about they couldn't, the, the traffic on the old Columbia River Highway gets backed up now because they don't have anybody managing the crosswalk like they used to do. So I, th I, th I think it's just like what you said, it's managing it. Um, we have we have a um, state quasi judicial or quasi agency down there, um, um, tra travel um, Oregon, or and and they they we did a we, we got some funding into rest areas, not very exciting, but uh, 
you know, uh, I think it's important to have our rest areas in good shape. So uh, we got that. So I guess that's the state of Oregon's big contribution to tourism is uh, we're going to get our uh, restrooms fixed up a little bit. Okay. Yeah. We want to we want to squeeze in another uh, topic here. Uh, marijuana in the workplace, Senate Bill 301, is a frightening thought to all employers, businesses, nonprofits, and public. The bill got a hearing this session. Under what circumstances would you support marijuana in the workplace, or would you? I'm a nurse. I'm a retired nurse, and I've always been against uh, marijuana in the workplace. I've been against even recreational marijuana, so I'm not the good person to answer that. I am pretty, pretty, um, very concerned uh, regarding marijuana in the workplace. I strongly support medical marijuana. I have actually had relatives who they, they could not have survived their pancreatic cancer. They could not have survived their, the pain that they were going through uh, with some of the neurological pro problems that they've had. So I, I believe in that, but uh, I, for one, will be fighting tooth and nail against um, uh, marijuana in the workplace unless there are some businesses, you know, I have to hear from the businesses. I, I don't know where it will work. Maybe there are some businesses where it will work, but I, no one's told me about that. Oh, I'm, I'm a definite no uh, marijuana in the workplace. I voted no on every uh, marijuana, pro-marijuana bill ever. Uh, I even voted no on a marijuana bill that uh, kept marijuana producers from selling it a thousand feet from school. And then one of my uh, Democratic senators, uh, Floyd Przanski, came up to me and says, Thompson, I don't think you want to vote no on that one. And I changed my vote, luckily, because that was actually a good one. I just see marijuana, I vote no. Um, I was. I was at our county today just chatting. I was a 16-year county commissioner, and I went in there to do some planning stuff. was just chatting with the human resource director. There was some, some state back east at, uh, where uh, medical marijuana is legal, and of course they have a, um, just it's, it's like the law is right here now in Oregon. You, you can't, it's a no, what's the, what's the term? Uh, if, if you're caught with a drug test of marijuana, you're fired, or uh, there's a certain phase, phrase for that. Um, and stupid. Yeah. Anyway, she said that somebody, uh, somebody came, applied for a job, told the human resource person that uh, she has to take medical marijuana for Crohn's disease. They hired her and then uh, did a blood test fired her because uh, she tested positive for marijuana, and now they have a lawsuit. So um, whether, you gotta be really, really careful in the human resource department after hearing something like that, uh, you know, they, they uh, were probably trying to help that employee out or whatever, and um, so even though it says that um, if they fail a drug test, you can fire them or they can't work for you anymore, you have to be really, really careful because that kind of stuff's starting to show up. So, and I'm sure that'll spread all over the country. So. Um, okay, you guys. These were the only two that showed up. We want to thank them so much for the wonderful job that they did. Okay, in part because I have walked in your shoes, I can say this, but I'm not talking about myself when I say this. When we elect somebody, we have high expectations. Even when you vote against them, you have high expectations of how bad they're going to be. Oh. Either way. I mean, you do. I'm just saying that. We have expectations when we vote. We expect them, once they get down there, to do exactly what we think they're going to do, either really bad or really good. We expect them to be superhuman. They're human. We expect them to know everything about everything immediately, about every subject, about every bill, about every vote, about every perspective. We expect that from them. But they're still human. But what we have before us right now are two humans that have taken the time away from their families and their lives to represent us the best they can from their perspective. We don't always agree on everything. 
but they have given their all, and we should give them ours. So let's applaud them one more time. You go behind me, don't fall off the stream. Okay, um, on your tables, we have Leadership Academy. I want to remind you the Leadership Academy is taking applications right now, and the closing date is September 1st. This is last year's brochures, so the schedule that you see in here, the topics will remain the same, but not in that order. So please take a concentrated look at this and get the applications in as soon as you can. I want to thank again our sponsors, who we could not do this without. Riverview Community Bank. Portland General Electric, Gresham Barlow School District, and Metro East Community Media. Thank you all of you for your support. We appreciate that. Remember the flyers for the replay times are out on the table so that we can see this once again. Um, our upcoming topic in August, I don't know. It's gonna be a surprise. We'll see what we come up with. And last but not least, please take a minute to complete the evaluation form at your seat. That's the white piece of paper. If you haven't met one of our elected officials that are here as a school board member, a community college member, or city council, please do so. And if you have a chance, please meet the new superintendent of Gresham Barlow School District. Thank you so much for coming today. We'll see you next month. <laughs> <laughs>